Hi, I'm Angela Morton. I'm the Consortium Director for the Rural Communities Opioid Response Program in our region. And I'm here today for the next segment of our Recovery Is video series to address substance use issues, to bring awareness of treatment resources, um, the importance of prevention and recovery support. And I'm here today with Dr. Mandy Fobble, Director of Clinical Care Services at UPMC Western Behavioral Health at Safe Harbor, and Rick Orlowski, Drug and Alcohol Program Director at Family Services and Children's Aid Society in Franklin. Thank you both for being here today. Thank you for having us. So mm -hmm. Rick, can you tell us about your work? Sure, Angela, thanks. Again, thanks for, for asking me to do this. Um, my name is Rick Orlowski. I'm the Program Director for Family Services and Children's Aid Society's Drug and Alcohol Program. Um, I've been in this position for eight years. Um, I actually have been in the field of addiction, working in the field of addiction since 1985. Um, and I started out in the uh, in an outpa outpatient IOP component, um, worked there for a few years, went into the prison system, worked in the prison system for 20 years, um, primarily uh, um, running a ther therapeutic community, community, a drug and alcohol uh, therapeutic community. Um, did that for several years, retired in 2010. And uh, at 2010, given my age here, I was 52 years old, and I thought that I can just cut my grass and golf all the time. And then uh, um, <clears throat> my higher power actually had other plans for me, and I got offered this job as, as director. And uh, having two boys that uh, were going to college, I figured it was time to get back into, into it uh, because I love drug and alcohol. I love working with people. Um, you know, I've been in recovery for 40 years. And, uh, you know, I work with people, you know, from the, from the support group perspective, you know, I continue to go to AA meetings, um, even to this day, um, you know, and I think that they, you know, they work hand in hand. Um, you know, when I got in this field in 85, and I like sharing this because um, when I started at the outpatient component, the, one of the guys who I continue to consider my mentor, he was somebody who was not in recovery. And, uh, but he was somebody who, when you talk with him, that he was, you thought that you felt that he was in recovery. And one of the things that he did was um, working in the field, he, he learned, he learned the population that he was working with. And he went to self-help meetings. They talk about in treatment and suggest when you get out through 90 meetings in 90 days, as a therapist, that's what he did. He read the big books. He got really educated about it. And I thought that that was just awesome because I over here have the experience. He didn't have the experience. He had a lot of book knowledge and a lot of experience, but he was willing to, to mesh them together. And that's how I kind of like lead my life into my recovery and in, into my job. You know, I went to college and I did get that education, but I, I just put them both together and I think that it works real, real well. You know, um, there's a lot of people that don't even know that I am in recovery. Um, I'm not, I'm very open with it, but I'm not one that just goes out and tells everybody that I'm in recovery. Um, but for me, that has, that has really helped because, you know, when I got into recovery, you know, it was, it was that, that stigma of, of being an alcoholic and being a drug addict was there. You know, I grew up in a home that there was alcoholism and drug addiction and it was hidden in the home. We never allowed it out or we thought that we didn't allow it wanted it out but uh you know other people knew about that but today you know for me you know it's one of those things that uh you know i consider an illness it's a disease i shouldn't be ashamed of, of having the disease and an illness and uh you know through going through treatment going through halfway house going through self-help meetings and, and reading the literatures and the books and and applying those 12 steps to my life you know it has really helped me into working in this field of addiction you know um I, don't, I am not one who believes that you have to be in recovery to work in this field. You don't, you know. Um, all that did was just give me a little bit of a legwork, you know, hitting out there and, and uh, you know, it's, the people that are not in recovery, people, they don't have to have the scars on their head like I do. You know, they don't have to go to jail like I did, you know. Um, but uh, addictions about feelings and thoughts and actions and things like that. And the, the non-recovering person has feelings, thoughts. Okay, and they feel certain ways and they can identify. So, you know, I encourage all my staff who work in this field to, to get engaged in self-help meetings, to look at, you know, to, to attend the meetings and see what they're about. 
um, because the population that we work with is one that is very, very difficult. You know, as we know, there's a lot of denial. You know, we, we know that there's a lot of a lot of folks that because uh, we get a lot of folks that are referred by probation and parole and, and they do not want to be here and they do not feel that they have a problem with, with you know, um, alcohol and or other drugs. And so, you know, it's our responsibility to to at least you know, to try to educate them, to give them some tools you know, to open up their eyes, to see how their life is unmanageable you know, and that they are powerless over substances and that there is a lifestyle change for them. So I think, you know, overall for me, you know, having having that, you know, that's that street time, but also having the recovery time and then getting into the field has meshed real well for me. It sounds like it. I was so struck too when you were talking about how your mentor wasn't in recovery and I think you meant like recovery from substance use but as you were talking I kept thinking about how really what you were describing is that the principles of recovery all of us can benefit from you know it sounds like you really have seen that that working a program to better yourself and when you said well everyone experiences thoughts feelings and behaviors we all can relate to that we all can relate to kind of a quest to quest for wellness or a quest to be better or to make changes in our life um, that really resonated with me. Um, and I got to thinking too, you said, I think 40 years um, yeah. of experience, right? And I'm wondering how, when you look around at the landscape, how do you feel like definitions of recovery have changed over the years? Or like, what do you think is different about where we're at now versus maybe when you first started in um 85. okay when i got in when i got in the field of addiction well, let, let me just oh. let me back up if i may when i got into recovery in 1980 i didn't wake up one morning and say i was an alcoholic or a drug addict i got involved in the legal system so the legal system you know and, and thank goodness that i had a judge that that was willing to allow me to to um have that opportunity to go to rehab instead of going to jail and uh, and so when I got into the recovery at that time, there was a lot of people that were being forced into treatment. They were being you know, court ordered to go into rehab. They were court ordered to do that. And so so for me, you know, I, I went and ended up going to rehab and just followed through with what those recommendations because I stayed sober out of fear because I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go to jail. I mean, I was smart enough not to want to go to jail, but I didn't know for sure if I wanted to uh, to. Um, stay sober or not but by having them actually force me to do some things i did it and, you know and god willing it, it, it happened but back then and from today and moving forward you know a lot of the you know you know things have changed in the sense of you know back then a lot of people were being forced and people are still being forced today but there's also a lot of people that just were, were coming into the programs and, and off the street you know from the homes from employers, they were having problems in their life and, and they were going to get ready to get divorced and that type of stuff. And we, we see that today, but it doesn't seem like as prevalent as it used to be. And I'm not sure what why that is. You know, from, from my perspective here at Family Services, the clients that we get are primarily probation and parole. We very rarely get people just coming in because, hey, my life is just, you know, not well right now. My wife or husband is, 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 uh, <clears throat> claiming they're going to leave me if I don't stop drinking. We don't see that a lot. And I think that's one of the big differences today. You know, um, back back when I got into the field, there was obviously alcohol, uh, alcohol use and abuse. You know, still is today. There's a, the marijuana. That's a whole new subject. Um, there was the opioids back then. You know, there was the, the cocaine. There was the methamphetamine. So the drugs are very similar. The behaviors are very, very similar. Today, what they have uh, matriculated through to was to the um, to the uh, medicated assisted treatment. You know, back back in when I was in the field in '85, you know, there were some folks that were in the methadone programs, but they didn't have suboxone or anything like that at that time. Um, or wasn't using it. Um, we had a lot of we had a lot of alcoholics who were on the interviews, and we don't see that today. You know, we don't see that a lot of people coming in. So um, I think that the biggest change that I really see is the medicated assisted treatment that gives up folks that opportunity to, to, to get off their drugs you know, and take a look at their life. Mandy, that's, um, 
a good segue into if you'd like to share even just a, a, a brief moment of what is medication for opioid use disorder. We haven't talked a lot. We all talk about that, but this is the first time it's coming up in our series, and it is a really important topic. It, it is a really important topic. And Rick, you mentioned methadone, which is our sort of oldest um, medication that's out there to treat opioid use disorder and certainly is an evidence-based program to get people help. You also mentioned buprenorphine, which is a medication used to treat opioid use disorder. And then you mentioned some medications that are out there that are evidence-based to treat alcohol use disorder. So sometimes people get stuck into thinking that medications are only for opioid use disorder, whereas in reality, we also have medications that can help people dealing with alcohol use needs. So medications, I think, are one tool for people, and not everyone benefits from medication, but many, many people do. And probably if I could share one thing, it's that medication to treat opioid use disorder saves lives. We do know that, that there's a distinct relationship between taking medication and reduction of risk for overdose. And we all know that the opioid epidemic has hit the United States very hard. It's particularly hit our region. So anything that we can do to reduce the, the impact of death right? We want to do for our communities. And Rick, I really liked what you said, which is that medication can also put people in a place of wellness where they can even look at their life to maybe make some of the other changes that will support recovery. Too often what I hear from people is that medication is, it's like swapping one drug for another. Right. When in reality, it's medication, it's treated like medication, it doesn't create the same effects as illicit drugs do, and it also, again, significantly reduces the risk of overdose. It gets people in a place where they can really start to talk about wellness and talk about what recovery is going to look like for them. So I would agree that technology has really changed in terms of availability of medications and the ability to access those medications. Yeah. You know, I have, to be, I have to be honest, one of the things that when I, uh, early on, I was one who was not a supporter of medicated assisted treatment, you know, in my recovery process, just like you had indicated, you're not clean and sober if you're doing this, this, this. But I have found, you know, through talking with people, through a lot of trainings, you know, and being open-minded that, it, that it's a great tool to utilize, you know, and it can really benefit people. And even in the recovery community, sometimes that's a big struggle. You know, because as you said, Mandy, that uh, um, you're not clean and sober because you're on Suboxone or, or you're on methadone, whatever. You know, and I think that that's something that we have to change that mindset to get people to understand how beneficial that that can be for them. I would agree. And I think it also speaks to changing our definition of recovery and talking with people about how recovery looks different for different people there it's it's a spectrum it's not like when you said well it's not like i woke up one day and decided bang i was going to completely change my life i mean most of us that's not what happens when we're trying to make an important life change so thinking of recovery as a sort of bridge to wherever better place we're going to get and we're somewhere along that bridge um, I think can be really helpful and it's gonna it's gonna be different for me than it might be for you than it might be for Angela but um, talking about that I think is so important for stigma reduction and I'm, I'm glad that you even talked about how what helped you to kind of think a little bit differently about the evidence that's out there and I think also for myself as being you know in a position I am and you know the experience that I have is also helping to educate the staff that I have you know, because, again, I came from a school that AA and NA meetings is where it was at. That was it. You know, that's where you got clean and sober at. But I found out over the years that there's a whole broad spectrum of different things out of different support groups. There's people stay sober on their own. So there's not one fits all, you know, purpose for recovery. Yeah, and I think you both have mentioned some things that are always on my mind when we talk about substance use. Um, the language we use and the, the perceptions, our own perceptions, and just being aware of stigma and how we treat, how we talk about this issue. Um, like Mandy, you had mentioned recovery is sort of a, a, a bridge. There are many different steps that recovery doesn't have to mean that, that you are 
in complete abstinence at all times. Recovery is a, a, a series of experiences, and and we like to continue to talk about how recovery is different for everyone. So it could be you've just decided today you want to make some changes and you want to be healthier and safer. And that doesn't mean tomorrow is going to be perfect. It means that you make a conscious effort today. So with the language we use, the question Mandy asked you about how things have changed over time in your experience in recovery and working in the field, um, the language is kind of changing and we're checking ourselves and using different terminology that may be different in recovery world mm -hmm. than it is in treatment world. Like just even medication assisted treatment is starting to shift into MOUD or medication for opioid use disorder or pharmacotherapy, or we don't say relapse as much anymore. We talk about a recurrence of use. And there's research to show that the language we use can either discourage or encourage a person to get into treatment and get the help they need. So what do you think about that and how that has changed? Well, I think that has changed again, just, you know, cause I, it's funny because I'm, you know, I'm so old school that I have, a, I don't, I have, I find myself sharing a lot about addiction, about addicts, about alcoholics, and not, not getting into the, into the terminology of, you know, individuals with substance use disorders, you know, that type of thing. And it's taken me some time to adapt to that. And I try to, I try to utilize it. But again, that stigma, again, that stigma of you're an alcoholic, you're an addict is something that I think that really strikes a chord for some people and they want to put those blocks up whenever they hear that. Yeah, I think, um, Angela, this whole theme for me has really been about how do we let people know that help is out there and what resources are there? Because, Rick, I keep circling back to you saying you don't get as many people that self-identify in need. And then I heard Angela saying about how the language that we use can really change that and the strategies that we use could really get more people maybe interested in help. And so I think I'm leaving today's meeting feeling like, oh, man, we got to do more to educate like this. We have to do more to let people know where they can get help. And Angela, I know you have a phone number that you're going to share with us. And I feel like um, I hope people watching kind of start to think of themselves as like ambassadors for this conversation and just letting people know that you don't have to wait until it's a crisis. You can get help as soon as you're ready to do that no questions asked. You know, it doesn't have to get to the point where it comes from a judge. We, we will welcome that always, but um, we want people to know too that there are other options to get help much farther upstream. Even, even before maybe we're talking about people with a substance use disorder or anybody struggling, but there's also this large area of people who could be at risk before you even get to that point. So if someone watching suspects that, wow, you know, especially during the pandemic, I've really been doing a lot more of A, B, and C, or, or any of the above, that I'm, I'm vaping or, or smoking or drinking or using whatever substance or eating differently, anything that can become problematic for your health, getting ahead of it, as you said, a little further upstream rather than waiting until it's a crisis situation is really valuable. So um, if anybody is um, listening or watching and um, wants to share this number widely, share it through social media, share it with a family or friend who needs it. It's the National Helpline. It's 1-800-662-HELP, the letters H-E-L-P, 1-800-662-HELP. And you can also call your local county drug and alcohol office or what we call single county authority. So whatever county you're in, if you Google or call or 411 um, local county drug and alcohol office, you'd be able to go through there too. So thank you both for joining. Any final thoughts? No, I just want to say thanks for having me. And it's always a, uh, a nice topic or a good topic to talk about, to, to let people know and become aware. So thanks for having me. And my final one is I think I really learned something from Rick today just in terms of the importance of letting people know that it's also okay to catch a meeting and that we are thinking about um, this in terms of how to get connected to a formal treatment service, but 
Also, walking into one of those meetings can be an excellent first start for people too. And there's a whole range of 12-step opportunities now online even for people that maybe are a little bit reluctant to um, go in person. And so Rick, thank you for reminding me about the value of um, that peer-to-peer -peer connection and the sort of open meeting concept. Thank you. And Rick, where's the best place for someone if they don't have internet access? Is there somewhere they can call or um, for those who do have internet access, is it just a quick Google search of NA or AA meetings near me? Yeah, that's exactly what you need to do. AA meetings or AA or NA meetings near me, and it'll bring up you know different different uh, links to hit, to hit. So. Okay. Well, great. Thank you both for joining us, um, and thank you all for joining us for Recovery Is.